And with all, all the talk around the election, leading up to the, the election, all the talk about the issues uh, that were being raised, all the talk about resistance to Trump, all the talk since the election about the imp policy implications going forward of the uh, control of the House, of representatives changing. You know what really hasn't been talked about a lot? Military policy, foreign policy in the broadest sense. Uh, it's really gone off the radar. And our next guest uh, follows military policy very closely. He's been on the uh, program quite a bit, and he is also uh, writing a lot on this topic. He's written several pieces that are very germane to this topic, uh, I, and I want to talk to him about why we've overlooked it and the secrecy that seems to be enshrouding our military policy. Major Danny Sherson is a U.S. Army strategist. He's a former West Point instructor. He has served uh, in both Iraq and Afghanistan. His memoir and, and critical analysis of the Iraq War is entitled Ghost Riders of Baghdad, Soldiers, Civilians, and the Myth of the Surge. And once again, he joins us now. Danny, as always, thank you for coming on the program. Oh, thanks so much for having me. I'm glad to talk today. Oh, it's always great to talk to you, and you always bring a, a really great perspective to these issues. So you wrote a number of pieces recently, as you are inclined to do. You're very prolific, and I admire that. Uh, but one of your pieces was on uh, was given the headline, not on the agenda, or maybe you gave it the headline, America's wars are a non-factor in today's midterm elections. Is that as disturbing to you as it is to me? It is utterly disturbing to me um, as an American citizen, but especially as a veteran of the wars since 9-11, wars that are entering their 18th year, okay, as of October. Uh, very disturbing. I'll tell you a little of the uh, inside baseball on in that article. I woke up Monday morning with no intent to write a Tuesday article. I already had something else in mind. And uh, I just couldn't get the, the idea out of my mind as I watched CNN uh, and the vapid coverage of the upcoming midterms the day following. So I muted the TV and I typed for an hour. Stream of consciousness, Jack Kerouac style, what was on my mind. And what was on my mind is that it – pity the nation, I thought. Pity the republic that doesn't even speak of the seven ongoing – hot shooting wars in the greater Middle East that we are engaged in. Pity the nation and the citizenry that doesn't even discuss the longest war in a nation's history on the day of what we've been told by both Barack Obama and Donald Trump, polar opposites, what we've been told is the most important election cycle in our lifetimes. That's what they told us on Saturday and Sunday during their dueling press conferences or their dueling rallies, and yet all I could think of is, what about Afghanistan, for example? What about the mayor from Utah who just died in an insider attack? What about the general who was just wounded? What about the fact that Americans, and even more uh, in, in higher numbers, local Afghans are dying in America's longest war, and we don't even discuss it on the day of the election? You know, it is striking to me, and one of the things I, I used to be concerned, and I think rightfully, that sometimes to justify wars uh, that this country engaged in uh, on really what I would call flimsy strategic basis, you know, and really not necessarily justified in any rational way, we would uh, drum up this war hysteria, this kind of jingoism and fear, as we did when we went into Iraq, a very misguided uh, situation, in my opinion. But it seems now, I'm thinking this might be even worse. We, uh, nobody even feels the need to do that. It's just like they go on and on and on. As you put it, your first sentence, the United States military is actively fighting in seven Muslim-majority countries, and no one cares. Uh, it, it just amazes me, that, you know, in 1984, we have always been at war with East Asia. It's now, we don't even have to talk about it. We don't even have to make that statement. It's like these wars are invisible. There's a degree of strategic apathy among the public. Um, they're numb to war, um, something Americans have never really experienced before. What we are finding in this very, um, really infamous and unprecedented moment is that if you stay at war long enough, if you keep the American casualties below a certain threshold, the American people will submit to forever war. They will submit to it, and, and we're finding that to be the case. Um, 
it is very much like 1984. The new speak that we use, we use terms now like generational war, and we use it um, in a non-sarcastic and non-flippant way. We're dead serious when we use it. I mean, General Petraeus referred to Afghanistan as generational war. What does that mean? Well, that, that means we have no strategic end state. There is no exit strategy. You know, the first midterm election that I was highly engaged in was in 2006. I was in Iraq. I had been in Iraq for just a month by that point. And for all the flaws of the 2006 midterm elections, for all the flaws of America's two-party system, at least in 2006, the Iraq war, the failing nature of the Iraq war was on the ballot. The Democrats ran on that, okay, across the country, local races, statewide races. Democrats ran on an, uh, an anti-Iraq war platform or at least a platform to uh, negotiate a settlement. And there was a pretty big blue wave in 2006, bigger, in fact, than this last one because they took the Senate as well. Um, that sort of wave election based on foreign policy was utterly absent from this election cycle. I mean, I, I live in Kansas, and so I live on the eastern side of Kansas, so I get all the political commercials from the Senate in Missouri and uh, from the House races and the governorship of Kansas. And the commercials, they're awful, and they're constant, and it's just draining on your energy. But you know what I noticed? Not one commercial, not once mentioned an single, a single aspect of American foreign policy. That is profound, and that is disturbing. Yeah, and, and, and also it's, uh, it, it's an abandonment of, I would argue, the responsibility of the electorate as well as the politicians. I mean, we are supposed to be the people in a democracy, and uh, we can talk about the limitations of our democratic system, but we're, in a democracy, we're supposed to be the people who take responsibility for making these decisions. And I feel like, uh, uh, on the one hand, obviously the politicians and the news people are not bringing it up uh, on any cable channel or any news outlet, but I also feel as if we the people are not taking responsibility to say, you know what, this has got to stop. This is this is a drain of resources, this is a drain of human life, ours, and those are the people in these seven countries. This is fostering permanent hostility and, and talk about generation war, generations of, of people in these countries who will be hostile to this country and its interests. So we are, I almost feel as if we, the people, are abdicating our responsibility as well. Uh, the people are in complicit in forever war. We as citizens of an ostensible democracy have the obligation, have the obligation to understand what the military is doing because it is doing these things in our name. The Department of Defense operates in the name of the American electorate. OK, now there are limitations to our democracy. Um, Americans have sort of obviated all response their all of their own responsibility for war they've decided to cede that to the executive branch and let them do whatever they want but the military is still acting in our name and you know who knows that the people of the greater middle east they don't just blame the secretary of defense they don't just blame me the major or captain on the ground in their country they blame the american people so the damage we are doing to our own credibility to our own image in the world is so far reaching. I don't know that we will. Uh, I don't know that the American people understand the damage we've done to understand the damage we've done to the Middle East and the damage we've done to our own cause and our own image in the world. Poll after credible global poll states that the most people in the world see the United States and Israel as the two greatest threats to world peace, not Iran, not Russia, not China, not even little North Korea. They see us as the greatest threat to global peace. Now that may be an exaggeration and we can we can debate that. But the fact that it is believed widely across the world is itself true or not a problem. And again we're talking with Major Danny Sherson and Danny I guess I would you know I I struggle to there there was a time when for example the Democrats for, you know, there are pros and cons to being seen as the quote unquote peace party too, but there were times when the Democrats were seen as a peace party. There was a time when there was an active peace movement in this country. It seems to me that uh, there's plenty of blame to go around in this current situation, uh, but that a lot of the blame might reside in the fact that people who think of themselves today as liberals or progressives 
very often abdicate this responsibility. And I think they do it in a couple of different ways. I think they do it, one, by, you know, they might see you somewhere in uniform and thank you for their ser thank say thank you for your service, but they don't think about the fact that they asked you to to con engage in that service at risk to life and limb. I, it's almost as if they kind of outsource their conscience to the military. And I also think another piece of this, and I, I you know I've talked to a lot of veterans of World War II, and I, I I think this is a difference between today's generation and let's say. Everybody who fought in World War II, all the enlisted men, and they were men by and large, even though I had an aunt in that war as well, but you know that generation basically, let's say, took general, I don't want to get you in trouble, but they understood, let's just say they understood the generals, for example, were human beings and capable of flaws like anybody else, mistakes like anybody else did not. But I feel as if the, the, the left today, broadly speaking, kind of idealizes generals they can do no wrong, kind of mythologizes the mil military without stopping to think about, well, who gave the military uh, their instructions and what's their responsibility, including perhaps a responsibility at times to question recommendations of the military as civilians who su supposedly oversee the military and say, I'm not sure I want to do that. Do you get what I'm driving at? 100%. Um, I think the American people have uh, have ceded uh, war and war policy to the military and civilian defense department um, officials that are in charge. Uh, rather than question the military, we overadulate the military. The only responsibility the citizenry believes it has to the military any longer is to thank them and then get out of the way. Thank them and get out right. of the way. That is not citizenship. Okay. The military is, we are, risk, we, I, and I want to say again my disclaimer that I do not speak for the Department of Defense. This is me in an unofficial capacity, but I serve the people ostensibly. Okay, that's the way it's supposed to be. Uh, so I want to say that, and I, and, I, and I also want to say something else, which is about the Democrats. Um, you said there was a time when there was a, a real anti-war movement. That's correct. Okay, and it took, it, it had some role in ending the Vietnam War, not completely, but it was part of the, the role. I think the Democrats today are cowards. They are scared to death to look weak. They have ceded the high ground to the Republicans on foreign policy. So the Democrats want to be the party of health care and immigration and domestic issues. They don't want to talk foreign policy because they're terrified of being painted with the broad brush of being doves or pacifists. And I will tell you when this started. As a historian, this started after the defeat of George McGovern in 1972. Right. George McGovern, who was uh, a liberal Democrat uh, from, from, from the, the Mountain West, this is a man who – uh, served honorably uh, as a bomber pilot in World War II, which was the most dangerous position in the European theater of the war, the most dangerous job. This is not some peacenik by nature. He served his country honorably, but he called for the end of the Vietnam War, and he ran in 72 on ending that war. Now, he lost to Nixon in a landslide, okay? And that is unfortunate. The problem is the lesson that the mainstream Democrats who still dominate the party, regardless of the new faces, the mainstream Democrats who still dominate the party, we're talking the Hillary Clinton wing now and the Joe Biden wing, they decided after McGovern that in the interest of victory, they could never again be the party of McGovern. McGovern, this, this wonderful man with this intense uh, hatred for the Vietnam War, they decided never again will we run as the anti-war party because if we do we're going to be we're going to be labeled with the brush of treasonous anti-american anti-soldier and in the interest of winning they went in what has become a neoliberal direction right and by the way interesting uh, you you probably know this because of your historical interest but uh uh george mcgovern was and and the party at when he led it was the, the phrase that was used to diminish and to dismiss them was uh, was that it was the party of acid, amnesty, and abortion, meaning LSD, amnesty for draft evaders, and abortion, you know, self-explanatory, uh, which is everybody assumed Richard Nixon deployed that phrase against him. You know where that phrase comes from, Danny? 
I don't, actually. It was coined by Thomas Eagleton, who was right. George McGovern's running mate initially until he was forced off the ticket because of revolution, uh, revelations about mental health problems. But it was a Democrat. It was a more centrist Democrat who came up with that pejorative term. So the party has already had that, always had that split within it of people who are willing to stand up uh, against misguided military interventions and those who are not. And obviously, George McGovern was not against all military interventions or he wouldn't have been, you know, a hero as he was in World War II. So, uh, and again, we are talking with Major Danny Sherson, who is a U.S. Uh, Army strategist and but is speaking strictly for himself. I was trying to cover you on that as well, Danny, um, about, uh, about uh, the military. And of course, you know, my sense is that uh, this lack of civilian oversight, this lack of courage, and I would agree with you, on the part of Democrats to really challenge these these pointless and, and deadly wars is, uh, is a failure of courage. Uh, now, we're also, it feels as if with the complicity of, uh, of the Democratic Party, and we'll see if that continues now that they have the House, I fear it will, uh, as you write in a couple uh, recent pieces, the military is retreating into uh, deeper levels of secrecy. You you, you wrote about uh, uh, the lessons of Iraq that the military uh, historians uh, put together a piece about it, but it's being suppressed. That's my understanding from reading you, and that the culture of secrecy and the level of, is being strengthened. The level of transparency is being reduced, and it, and, and again, we're talking about. Uh, an institution that is supposed to be controlled by the people, but whose behavior is increasingly being hidden from the people who are supposed to control it. Uh, your thoughts? So uh, there's, there's actually four points I want to make, or four examples. Uh, this is a long-term trend. This isn't just a Trump problem, but it has um, it has increased, okay, based on the open source reporting that I follow. Um, the military is retreating into what I've called an empire of secrecy. Uh, in order to maintain these perpetual wars, it's important to actually hide information from the public because the more the public knew about the problematic nature of these wars and of the military industrial complex more generally, the more apt the people and thus the house is to investigate. And then we don't want that. So uh, for examples, recent examples of the last two years of increasing military secrecy, decreasing military transparency. One, under the Obama administration, even in the late George W. Bush administration, the Department of Defense was on the cutting edge of climate change. What I mean by that is the Department of Defense wrote papers recognizing that climate change was actually the greatest existential threat to the nation and that it would require military action because there's going to be refugee crises, there's going to be mass flooding. So um, they, they recognize climate change as real and as a potent threat. Since 2016, the very term climate change has been basically erased from military lexicon and it's been replaced with with you know obtuse phrases like extreme weather okay new speak and euphemisms that's number one number two in the past the military has had to provide reports to the congress and to the public open source non-classified reports on the progress of new military weapon systems okay these are the billion dollar projects hundreds of billion dollar projects sometimes for new weapons we had to report how we whether we were on target how the systems were working, that now has mostly been classified. Third point, the Afghan war, okay? One of the main metrics of the Afghan war to judge whether we are winning or losing, whether we are successful or unsuccessful, is the level of casualties for the Iraqi security forces. I'm sorry, the Afghan security forces. We don't have 100,000 soldiers on the ground anymore. Instead, we have 14,000 soldiers on the ground, and their purported mission is to train and advise the Afghan army to win the war. Well, here's the problem. Afghan soldiers are getting killed by the Taliban at a higher and higher rate every year, so much so that it's actually unsustainable because the Afghan government cannot recruit soldiers fast enough to replace those that are getting killed. So there was always an internal audit that the Department of Defense did where it reported annually how many Afghan soldiers were killed. And the numbers have been jumping from, say, 5,600, give or take, in 2015 up to about seven or 8,000 in 2016. And we estimate 10,000 or more in 2017, the last year. Why do we estimate? Because upon the ascension of this administration, that data became classified. The American people will not, cannot know how many Afghan soldiers are being killed by the Taliban. 
Because they can't know that, they cannot hold the military accountable. They cannot judge the veracity of this war. Final point, and this is internal, and this will upset people in the military. At least on my base, and I fear across the Department of Defense network, there is internal, uh, there is an, an internal suppression of certain messages. I will give you one example. The really excellent websites, which I have to admit I write for one of them, okay, full disclosure, Tom Dispatch and The Intercept, okay, very creditable but left-leaning organizations, have been blocked with a firewall. Military members and military and, and civilian employees of the Department of Defense cannot see those sites from their work computers. Okay, so is it just the left that they're against, or is it they just don't want politics in general to be reported? No, it's a suppression of the left. How do we know that? Because non-credible, offensive, and conspiracy theory pe peddling websites on the right, such as Breitbart and Infowars, are still clear for members of the military to peruse. So these are four examples to show you, just four among many, to show you that there is uh, a creeping of overclassification and increasing secrecy coming out of the DOD today. And again, I say that as myself, unofficially not speaking for the DOD. Understood. And um, let me ask you a couple questions before we go back to the security issue. What is, uh, is it still uh, public knowledge, the total number of members of the Afghan military? That is still public knowledge. So uh, one way that you could uh, go around the classification is to, is to try to figure out the, the difference in numbers right. from one year to the other. The problem with that is, and this is even worse, the Afghan army and Afghan police have another problem, which is desertion rates are increasing. Okay. So you right. can't necessarily tell how many are casualties versus how many are just going home and saying they're taking their ball, going home and saying this isn't worth it. You know, I'm not being paid enough to die in these remote provinces that I'm never going to that I'm never going to pacify. So uh, the Afghan army and the Afghan security forces are facing a twin dilemma of increasing casualties and increasing desertion rates. And they may be overstating uh, uh, the the manpower levels because they don't even know from day to day how many people have taken off. Uh, but what's the official uh, what's the official number these days? Do you know off the top? Of you your know, head? I, I, off the top of my head, we're, between the police and uh, the national police, the local police, and the Afghan army, it's it's in the vicinity of five hundred thousand. So we're seeing. So you know, we're having pretty significant uh, casualty levels. If you're talking about ten thousand out of let's say half a million that's 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 a you're getting up to some real numbers there if um, if 10,000 americans died in afghanistan in a single year it would be um, a national scandal right. okay so that's just that's one way to look at it if, right. if if equivalent casualties were being inflicted on us it would be national news right and of course equivalent casualties would be a much larger number because we're a much larger country um so uh, so we have this increasing uh, air of secrecy around the united states military which and, and we have by the way you, you quote a, a chief army historian saying it would air too much dirty laundry to uh publish the uh the, the documents uh, or the full story of what happened in Iraq, but the, you know, that strikes me that there's inherent conflict of duty. I don't know if that's the right term since it's a military term, but there's a conflict between your duty as a historian and your duty as, a, as an army officer. I would think as a historian, his obligation is to tell the story. As a member of the military hierarchy, he may be obligated to, uh, you know, follow instructions, but I think the notion of history is dirty laundry is one that to me is contrary to the mission of being a historian. So I don't, I don't want to put you in a position of criticizing that guy, but, but, but uh, assuming that it's a guy, but, but uh, I do think that the, the culture of secrecy should be something of concern. And I, I, I hope the new uh, House leadership will demand more information. Uh, I'm not as optimistic as I, as I might be about that. Um, but uh, you also uh, quote uh, retired Colonel Frank Subchak as saying, you know, he's disappointed with the institution uh, for suppressing this. Uh, I guess before we go off this topic altogether, what would you suggest that citizens do? I mean, is there a way to, for example, yeah. write their representative and say you want to know more from the military about what's going on? Absolutely. So, um, look, the congressmen. Uh, are responsible and uh, respond to two types of pressure. Uh, one is um, constituent letters and calls, uh, and the other is big money lobbyists. Unfortunately, often the lobbyists are the more prominent of the two. Nevertheless, 
Congressmen go up for election every two years. Um, if the American people demanded foreign policy to be on the agenda, if the American people demanded less secrecy and demanded that the Iraq war report be uh, be immediately okay made public, then I think that there could be change coming from the House, especially on the uh, Armed Services Committees. I want to say one thing about the Iraq report. There are two problems with it. One is the fact that it's being suppressed or appears to be suppressed according to the reporting of the Wall Street Journal, not exactly a liberal source. OK, so that's the Wall Street Journal that broke this story. Um, if the story is true and it appears to be uh, to, to be credible, then that's a problem that we're suppressing it. The second problem is that having read the highlights, because that's all I've seen is the leaked highlights, just like everybody else. I don't have an inside track on this, but to read the leaked highlights. It appears that the Army's study focuses too much on tactics and not enough on strategy. So yes, it will poke holes in our tactical uh, missions over there, some of the mistakes we made early on during the invasion. But what it doesn't do is look at whether Iraq War II, okay, whether the Iraq War of 2003 was worth fighting or possible, whether the mission of creating a liberal democracy on the banks of the Tigris and the Euphrates was even doable. I contend that these wars, all of them, are unwinnable, that we have asked the impossible of the soldiers we purport to love. I will say this, Veterans Day is coming up. This would be what I would tell people. If you want to honor veterans, create less of us. Create less of us. That's the best way to honor veterans. Well, well said. And But before I let you go, I want to change gears altogether, uh, Danny Sherson, and talk about history just for about four or five minutes if we can, because you also, you've been writing this whole series on American history and your most recent piece uh, gets to one of my favorite periods, one of the periods I've been rereading about lately, which is the late 19th century, the period uh, and, and what the headline it was given, I don't know if you wrote it, uh, wealth, wealth and Squalor in the Progressive Era. Um, the, uh, this is an era that fascinates me, but I, and I'll tell you why. Just putting my cards on the table because this is when we built the labor movement. This is when we had gilded age inequality and had to do something about it. This is uh, when we had to build an awareness of what it meant to a good versus bad populism. And this is when money started really affecting the, well, it had been beforehand, but really affected the political process and so on. In other words, a lot of the battles that were fought then, I think we have to fight again. That's what I bring to a study of, of this era. But uh, what was your takeaway about this, you know, whether you call it the Gilded yeah. Age or the Progressive Era? What was your takeaway in reading and writing about it? My, te my takeaway in researching and then formulating this piece is that we should recognize as Americans how profoundly similar the late 19th century is to today. Um, wealth inequality in America today has reached the highest levels since the Gilded Age. Money in politics begins to dominate the United States political system in the Gilded Age, in the late 19th century of which I wrote. Give you one example. William Jennings Bryan is the Democratic candidate in 1896. He runs on a populist platform of supporting workers and farmers. He runs on a platform of increasing the money supply to relieve debt on the farmers. He gives somewhere in the vicinity of three, four hundred speeches while he rides the rails, the first ever time that a politician or a presidential candidate rode the rails across the country giving speeches. William McKinley, his opponent, gives no speeches and wins in a landslide. OK, what do we know about the two different parties? William Jennings Bryan raises the equivalent today of approximately three to four hundred thousand dollars in campaign contributions. OK, in today's dollars. That's it. Uh, William McKinley, with his corporate backers and the Republican Party, raised somewhere in the vicinity of $2 billion in today's dollars. So what we're seeing is money in politics and wealth inequality, and, and that exists in this era as much as it did in the late 19th century. We have to learn from our past. Final point on this, coming out this Saturday will be my next piece, which is on the foreign policy of the progressive era. And the other thing that that era has in common with today is that 1898 is the moment when Americans began seizing overseas colonies, expanding outside of the continent and becoming imperialists. And I would argue that today we are neo-imperialists doing much the same thing. Yeah, you know, your your takeaways and mine are so similar in so many ways, and I really appreciate your perspective on it. And I'm looking forward to your next piece and the one after that, because, you know, a lot of progressives today uh, fondly remember uh, Teddy Roosevelt as president and for his progressive 
uh, economic policies, as do I in many ways, but progressives, perhaps this is tied into the political problem we were talking about at the start, progressives do tend to forget that he was an extremely, unless my memory fails me completely, an extremely warlike and aggressive president, very much a part of this imperialist strategy at the same time that he was uh, more progressive at, at home than, than his predecessors. Fair summary, you think? Absolutely fair summary. Teddy Roosevelt is a, is a, is a warmonger. Um, right. Any understanding of him, his trust busting is admirable at times, but one must remember this is a man who called the day of his charge up San Juan Hill as a colonel in charge of the 1st U.S. Cavalry Volunteer Regiment. He referred to that as the greatest day of his life. He shot a Spanish soldier who was running away in the back because he wanted so dearly to say that he killed someone. And he said that was the greatest day of his life. He yelled at the height of the charge, Godfrey, what fun. He said. Mm. So, yes, this was a warmonger. This was an imperialist. This is a man who wanted to build an American empire. And we have to hold that uh, at the same time balanced with his trust busting and more progressive policies domestically. Yeah. And I think we, I, my closing editorial comment would be that we have to vow to be uh, just as a progressive, if that's the right word, or enlightened in our foreign policy uh, as we are in our domestic policy, which would separate us uh, dramatically from someone like Theodore Roosevelt. So unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there. But as always, Major Danny Sherson, uh, speaking on behalf of yourself, not the United States military, uh, as always, thanks for the great writing. And as always, it's a pleasure to speak with you. Well, thank you. I'll keep it up. Uh, you know, for the listeners, keep watching. Keep watching the Google. I'll have the pieces out two to three columns a week, and I'm I'm just never going to shut up. I'm going to keep yelling from the mountaintops. So thanks for having me. Yep. Well, uh, keep up the good work.